The year 2019 will be remembered for the wave of protests that swept the world, with millions of people protesting to demand change. Often, those demonstrations turned violent. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, you know, when, when, a, when a student of mine would answer the question about any, any such question, would answer with social, economic, and political, I would say this is the wrong question. Uh, right. This is the wrong answer. Why? Because this is the answer for everything. You give me one phenomena nowadays, I will tell you, well, it's social, economic, and political. Well, of course it is. Mm -hmm. But as you were saying, and as Dr. Sharkawi said earlier, we are going through a very particular uh, phase in history. And I think we need to really pay attention to the spirit of the times, to the, to the climax of the time, beyond speaking in macro terms about, about economic and social. In other news, China, Russia and Iran are set to hold joint naval drills in the Gulf of Oman. This isn't just a military exercise, it's a, it's a political statement. The Strait of Hormuz is the world's most important oil artery. A fifth of our daily oil flows through it. 21% of global supply every day. It's a, it's a crazy amount. It says they are aimed at deepening exchange and cooperation between their navies. This comes amid heightened tensions between the U.S. and Iran. Both sides have been at loggerheads since Washington reimposed sanctions on Tehran last year after withdrawing from a landmark nuclear deal. We start with the U.S. imposed sanctions, drawing ire all over the world. And how long will countries wait before they respond? Well, it looks like a pretty loud response will be coming tomorrow when China, Iran, and Russia begin three days of Navy exercises in the Indian Ocean. And as I mentioned, you know, these developments are important because they allow us and our public to understand what's the situation, the real situation with Iran. Uh, often we have friends and allies in the region and beyond who are putting pressure on us. You, you need to do more on Iran, more in Iraq, more in Lebanon. The reality is that this joint exercise between Russia, China and Iran is a message that these two powers, nuclear powers, are telling the United States and our allies that we're not, quote, going to let Iran down if you do anything against it. So the calculations now uh, for the United States is to take into consideration that we're not just dealing with Iran, but also with an axis, a larger yeah. alliance, including those powers. In our current news cycle, we hear a lot about Iran and Russia working together, particularly when it comes to Syria. And I definitely want to touch on that point in a moment. But first, just weaving China back into this whole discussion regarding this, the Chinese Defense Ministry uh, said this about these naval drills, that it would deepen exchange and cooperation between the navies of the three countries. Of course, this is a very important area, very close to the Strait of Hormuz, of course, a major uh, area for, for getting oil tankers from place to place from Iran. UK is accusing Iranian boats of trying to intercept a British oil tanker. There seemed to be no end to this escalation. Washington and everyone with a warship or regiment to spare seemed to be rushing into the Persian Gulf. I mean, wasn't the nicest neighborhood to begin with, what with Saudi Arabia and Iran, mortal enemies facing off across the tiniest of channels. And when it seemed like things couldn't get worse, they did. The attack was launched from the north and was unquestionably sponsored by Iran. Amid all the calls for de-escalation, Iran has now launched an unprecedented attack on the world's energy supply. Having failed at max pressure, Secretary Pompeo's turning to max deceit, blaming Iran won't end disaster. So I think that would be throwing Trump a bit of a curve. Do you see a day where the US actually does have diplomatic relations with Iran? Do you ever see a future uh, where the U.S.? I, I, find it, I find that very hard to envision, just like I find it very hard to envision that we're ever going to have a normal relationship with Russia again. Hmm. 
And that's, and that's a very, very dangerous thing. I mean, we had more respect for Moscow during the Cold War when there were commies over there. So ever since there haven't been communists there, we've been extremely provocative and not treated them with any kind of respect. It's a bit of a paradox. We understand it's the first such trilateral exercise. And while, you know, Iran would be keen to position the drills as a message to the, to the world, you know, that they have friends, they have allies, China is a bit more cautious about doing that. And in fact, that's because China is unwilling to be drawn into the Iran-US conflict. And what essentially China wants is to be able to showcase uh, their destroyer, the seeming in this uh, naval drills and to also potentially sell weapons to Iran. So there's an economic aspect, there's a geopolitical power rebalancing aspect. So what does China's involvement mean for all of this? Well, look, China and Russia, but China made the statement, is telling us that we're, we're not going to allow you to seize and control this area and isolate Iran. This is very serious. That statement is very serious. And it could be also that they are willing, China and Russia, that is, to send some of their parts of their fleets or uh, ships into that area, which would complicate things. Great points. Yeah. yeah, really fascinating stuff. And, you know, the new year, who, who knows what the new year's <laughs> going to bring. It's like Happy New Year. and. You know, and hopefully let's go not, to war. And hopefully not the last New Year. <laughs> yeah, right. Jim Jatras, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Thanks Thank so you, much for coming in. Great talk and fascinating as always. U.S. cities remain on alert after an airstrike took out an Iranian terror leader in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Iran is vowing revenge. And President Trump tonight says he took action to stop a war, not start one. KKL 9's Randy Page joins us now with the latest on the rising tensions in the Middle East. Randy? These are dangerous times. General Qasem Soleimani, the architect of Iranian intelligence and military operations across the region for decades, a revered figure in Iran, today thousands mourning and protesting in Tehran. Iran's supreme leader vowing harsh retaliation and revenge. And Iraqi politicians with close ties to Iran are calling for the roughly 5,000 U.S. troops based here in Iraq to be ordered out of the country in protest. What makes this situation so dangerous here in the Middle East is that the Iranians will feel that they have to retaliate. Qasem Soleimani was a national hero, part of the military genius of Qasem Soleimani. However, we may judge him morally was that he understood that Iran cannot compete head on with the U.S. US. So he became a master of asymmetrical warfare, giving money and weapons to proxy groups and militia groups across the Middle East. And the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei tweeted that a severe revenge awaits the criminals who have stained their hands with his and other martyrs' blood last night. President Trump dismissed the threat, tweeting, while Iran will never be able to properly admit it, Soleimani was both hated and feared within the country. They are not nearly as saddened as the leaders will let the outside world believe. Soleimani's end was swift and shocking. Landing at Baghdad International Airport, he climbed into a convoy of SUVs, unaware that American drones were tracking him overhead. And yet tonight, some 3,500 more troops are being sent to the region and others put on alert. We begin tonight by reviewing the many protests that raged around the world this year, and we've talked about many of them right here on this show, often when the mainstream media has all but tuned out. In Hong Kong, the use of tear gas and live ammunition became common. Each protest movement had its own reasons, but they were united in their demand for democracy and fairness. Hong Kong's protests began in June against plans to allow people to be extradited to mainland China. Fighting between police and activists have become increasingly violent, with police firing live bullets and protesters attacking officers and throwing petrol bombs. People are demanding less influence from Beijing and the resignation of the leader Carrie Lam. 
Bolivia saw its biggest protests in decades following a disputed election in October. And we found that there have been parallels between these protests and often several corresponding factors driving the demonstrations. Among them, a feeling of exclusion among youth, the young, the young generation, concern about the future, and anger about a growing economic disparity gap in many of the cities and countries where protesters and demonstrators have hit the streets. It's the same kind of fuel that gave momentum to protests like Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring. I was there at Zuccotti Park when Occupy Wall Street began and I watched it not only grow bigger and big, bigger there in Manhattan but also spread across the country and across the world. And likewise, today there's a younger generation, what we call millennials, speaking out, raging against the machine of uh, often oppressive and corrupt governments and the wealthy elite, the 1% that gets richer while the rest continue to struggle. From Paris to Hong Kong, from Lebanon to Chile, the anger is the same. In many of these stories, it started with a smaller swell of movement growing into a large wave of protest for better living standards, quality of life, and higher wages, among many other demands. And one of the key ingredients in this recipe for resistance, the dismay and frustration that the rich keep getting richer. In fact, since 2010, look at this, Jeff Bezos, of course, of Amazon, made almost $100 billion more. Bernard Arnault, the chairman of the French company LVMH, which makes all those high-end products like Tag Heuer, watches, and the you know, various really expensive perfumes and clothing, he made $82 billion in 10 years. Bill Gates, who you know, has donated to various, you know, organizations and charitable organizations, made more than 50 billion in the last decade. Warren Buffett, almost 42 billion. Mark Zuckerberg upped his worth by 72 billion since 2010. And Mukesh Ambani, the Indian oil and gas tycoon, 30 billion. The list goes on and on. In 2010, the 10 richest people in the world had a reported total wealth of $296 billion compared to $822 billion today. Oxfam, the international human rights organization, reported this year that the 26 wealthiest people in the world own the same wealth as the poorest half of the entire world. Were there actually more protests around the world in 2019 than in previous years? It certainly feels like it when we're covering the news. Definitely there has been an increase in what we can call turbulent politics and collective action of the bottom-up forces versus the weakening top-down political institutions. For example, in Lebanon, it's not just about uh, the rejection of the situation by, the, by those young protesters, but also uh, a decline or a loss of momentum among the various political elites through different you know, nominations. So we are looking at this global wave. It seems to have spread across the global south. Then if we add the French case, that becomes more of a worldwide phenomenon. But definitely, I think it's not just about the causality that we witnessed in 2011, where people were asking for welfare and social justice and dignity and things like that. But now I think we have stepped into a higher level, which is a rejection of the status quo, the political institution of the state, either in the East or in the West. I think we are now beyond the causality of 2011. Can we say the economic order is, is driving this? Perhaps a rebellion against the economic order that has prevailed in many parts of the world since the end of World War II, but it's, it's seen as just not delivering for enough people anymore. Well, there are clearly some common economic aspects to, uh, to those protests. And uh, many of these protesters uh, uh, really mention issues that are really related to, to this uh, global economic context and to uh, uh, issues that are actually related to the global financial crisis and its, its consequences. So it's, it's really striking um, to, to see those, those common issues uh, in countries which have very different levels of economic development, whether Hong Kong, France and uh, Iraq. And of course, the economic situation and the political situation in all these countries are uh, extremely uh, different. 
uh, but still the, these crises point to, to, uh, to some global issues uh, and to this model of development that has been put uh, forward in, in, in the past 30 years. Well, the, in, in the past they used to, to, to appear to be a clear past uh, uh, following uh, the, the model of uh, one of the superpowers and then uh, this uh, um, liberalizing uh, model that uh, emerged uh, 30 years ago uh, and there were expectations uh, within populations across the globe and very different political systems that that would somehow uh, deliver uh, and things are, are much more complicated there's a sense of course those situations again are extremely different politically and also economically but there's a sense that uh, uh, elite the elite is not really aware of uh, the uh, the solutions of the way forward to to get out of the uh, the, the the political and economic uh, uh, impasse of the past uh, decade in particular since the the global financial crisis and uh, with um, the social media the type of organization of those protest movements uh, it's it's very decentralized and there are no clear indications of an alternative model that's that's really what's striking in all those protests uh, uh, across the globe and uh, um, liberal democracy certainly is is being uh, is being challenged but what we've seen develop over the past 30 years is not really a model of liberal democracy it's something something uh, quite quite different I think mm -hmm. liberal democracy is certainly still the, the, the way forward for, for, for most countries uh, but we have to redefine those those notions and in terms of economic strategy in terms of political stability in terms of the relations uh, between countries well I think at least there's some clarity in terms really of the uh, the dissatisfaction across the globe and those those popular uh, protests but the thing is there's no really clear path forward uh, there's no real uh, the mobilization hasn't led in any country to really something very concrete in terms of an alternative model or in terms of, of reforms and now we are on the brink of a new financial crisis on a global scale and uh, we might see the situation uh, deteriorate further for, for, for for the, the working class. All right, I think we've just got Marwan five seconds. I just think there's no end game for what goes on today. I think this is the nature and the spirit right. of our times. All right, thank you very much. I'm afraid we are out of time, although it is a fascinating topic.